You know, when is the last time you saw a guy named Muhammad run for Congress yeah. in Texas, right? Hey everyone, it's Akib Ghazi with the Palestinian Chronicles, and today we're here with Parvez Aguan. Thanks, Parvez, for um, um, allowing us to uh, interview you. I know, like, you're very busy. It's, a, it's almost election week, right? So um, we really, like, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It means a lot to me. We want to showcase people that are going to represent, you know, Palestine as, um, as well, but then also good guys that um, are running for good causes. Why are you doing this? Why are you running for office, public office? I think um, a few years back, you know, when my father passed away, it was really tough on my family. He, he struggled with the cost of his health care. Uh, you know, he was driving an Uber at the end of his life. He lost his job. He lost his health insurance. Uh, my brother was in college. I was living in Boston with my wife. And I think that experience of how expensive healthcare can be in this country. He was, he was in his early 50s, right? Uh, he passed away very suddenly. It kind of woke me up that the system's really broken. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. In the richest country on earth, no one should be going bankrupt when they get sick. In the richest country on earth, people shouldn't be paying $100 a vial for insulin. $35 now, but it's $6 in, in uh, Canada, Mexico. My dad was an early diabetic. In the richest country on earth, no one should be sleeping, you know, on the streets. Uh, this is the richest country on earth. We shouldn't have the issues that we're having. Uh, we shouldn't see the wars that we're seeing. You know, I got tired and fed up. You know, you know, we're, we're of the same age. You know, we grew up in the same kind of uh, uh, climate where we saw in 2014, then again in 2017, now again in Gaza, right? In Kashmir, in Syria, in Yemen, in, in Palestine, right? All over the world, in China, uh, Muslims were being victimized, were being attacked. And as a young Muslim American, I'm tired of seeing it. So, you know, there's a lot of domestic issues that kind of woke me up. But I think a lot of the foreign policy issues got me thinking, why isn't anybody doing anything about it? And I think, you know, as Muslim Americans, you know, we're people who uh, forbid what is wrong and join what is right. So I find it as my duty as a young Muslim to step up and at least try to do the least I can given my privilege. You know, I, I think this district that we're running in, it's prime for someone like us. So when you have an area like this, uh, and you have our kinds of voters who believe in what we believe, uh, it's time for us to step up. Okay, and, and talk about a little bit about your, your district. <clears throat> well, we're in it right now. Yeah. We're in Hillcroft. Okay, you know? we're here. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, this district is the most diverse district in Texas. It's a new district. It was just drawn last year. Okay. Uh, this district has more Asians and Arabs than any other district in Texas. I mean, okay. more Muslims, Hindus, Indians, Pakistanis, uh, uh, Palestinians, Jordanians, Syrians than any other area in Texas. Mm -hmm. There are almost 50 mosques, 12 mandirs, 3 gurudwaras in this district, <laughs> 4 jamaat khanas. You, you ever been to Agas on a Friday night? Of course, of course. That's half of oh, our votes, is. man. Okay. You know, oh, you know, okay. and then you got the other half at Philly Cafe. Okay. <laughs> so th this district, right, it runs from Fort Bend County, which is the most diverse county in America, up mm -hmm. over to Richmond, and it goes east to Sharpstown, Gulfton, A Leaf, and hooks into Montrose. It's a 30 mile east and west stretch. It's 80% black and brown communities. We only need around 20 to 25,000 votes to win the primary. Okay. There are 200,000 Arabs and Asians in this district. Mm -hmm. we, we, we have to get this done. Yeah. Um, and speaking of primary, you know, you have, and I want to kind of do a, a 180 before we get into, you know, you as a candidate. Um, we want to talk about Lizzie Fletcher a little bit. <coughs> you know, we know that. She's running off of, you know, APAC money, off of, I, be I believe, DMFI money as well. Uh, can you speak to that just a little bit? So the district changed. Fletcher's neighborhood of River Oaks is no longer in the district. The district's okay. our people. The district's diverse. The district's predominantly Latino, African-American, Asian, and Arab. Mm -hmm. The district goes all the way to Fort Bend County. It has a Indian American County judge. It has a Pakistani state representative. It has a Pakistani constable. It has a Palestinian district attorney. I find it unacceptable Congresswoman Fletcher, who lives in River Oaks, is trying to spend almost $2 million of Wall Street, big oil, Israeli money to try and buy an election in Fort Bend County. Mm -hmm. She doesn't understand our constituency. She refuses to call for a ceasefire. She's doubling down on the APAC endorsement. She's doubling down on the pro-Israel lobby rhetoric because she needs that money to stay in power. And I find it unacceptable. And this is our chance as a community for all of us to step up and realize our vote matters. It's not the general, it's the primary. Whoever wins this primary goes to Congress. Whoever wins this primary, voting starts February 20, goes until March 5th, is guaranteed statistically to go to the United States Congress. Mm -hmm. So this is the real election, and it's one-on-one, -on -one, us against APAC, us yeah. against Fletcher, who, you know, uh, most recently, I'm not sure if you saw, 
They sent thousands of letters, made thousands of phone calls to her office. She refuses to budge. I mean, 25,000 people are dead in Gaza now. What does it take? Most of them are civilians and, mm-hmm. and half of them are children. Yeah. What, what does it take for someone to go, this is not right? Our tax dollars should not be going to funding a deranged genocidal regime in Netanyahu, right? Mm-hmm. Like we have to get rid of them and we have to sanction him. Yeah. So for us to have a congressperson, our community that doesn't reflect our values, we give them the boot. Yeah. And you're, you're fighting APAC, essentially you're fighting APAC as Zionist lobby as well. So why have you run a campaign based off of support of the Palestinians? So two things, right? Number one, uh, human rights are objective, not subjective. Injustice everywhere is a threat to justice anywhere. Mm. You see what's happening in Gaza. You see what's happening in the West Bank. It is an open apartheid system. Uh, there is an occupation. There is oppression. Palestine must be freed because it is part and parcel of broader human rights justice across the world. You can't turn a blind eye from what's actually happening in Palestine, right? You can't. So that's number one, because it's just the right thing to do. Number two, what's really important, Akib, and for everybody that's listening, I think it's really important for us to realize APAC and the Israeli lobby are detrimental and threatening to our democracy, right? You cannot have big lobbyists groups funnel almost a hundred million dollars into elections. Elections should be fair and clean. They should be one person versus another, uh, an even race. You should not be able to take one to five to ten million dollars of dark money checks from a few billionaires living in New York. These people led an insurrection. These people want to destroy democracy. Democracy means even, ethical, fair playing field. We cannot have outside money buying elections. So it's not just because we're standing for the Palestinian people that we're attacking APAC. We're attacking APAC because their very existence threatens democracy. Mm -hmm. And how have you seen, um, have you seen much pushback or have you seen more support, you know, going up against APAC, speaking up about, you know, Palestine? Have you seen from your, you know, from maybe your future constituency, if, you know, if you're voted in, have you seen the overwhelming support or have you seen like a lot of you know, hate and, um, and things like that? We've seen a lot of hate. Our, our inboxes, our social media, our PO box, a lot of people out there are still very pro Netanyahu, pro Israel. Uh, even though 80% of Democrats support a ceasefire, many people don't understand the extent to how, uh, how, how brutal the Netanyahu regime really is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and unfortunately, we live in a society where my opinion is still a minority opinion because we haven't had the chance to run political campaigns spreading it. Now, two-pronged issue. There's a lot of hate coming our way. If you saw my Facebook comments or my Twitter DMs, you'd, mm. you'd, you know, they're calling me an anti-Semite. Uh, it, it's been horrible. If you believe in human rights everywhere, if you believe in justice, if you believe in, in, in American values, you must stand with the liberation yeah. of the Palestinian people. It's gone on for too long. Nelson Mandela famously said it. There's a billboard right out here, mm-hmm. right? Nobody's free until the Palestinian people are free, yeah. right? Number two, um, our constituents have stepped up. Uh, people realize now that this is not just a battle for universal health care, getting money out of politics. This isn't just a battle to elect grassroots Asian Americans, right? If I win, I'd be the first Asian American ever elected uh, from mm-hmm. Texas. I'd also be the youngest member of the delegation. It's not just about that. We have a chance to get into Congress and knock one person out who takes foreign lobbyist money and put someone in that can actually fight for foreign, foreign interests that are foreign interests, mm-hmm. right? I'm talking, it's very simple. I want to be the first to actually place bills on the floor that sanction the Netanyahu government. Mm-hmm. We have to actually go on the, bill, on the floor of the Congress and, and, and let them know that they cannot openly kill civilians. Uh, so quite frankly, I don't care if they hate me. Um, you know, uh, it's all right. We got a lot of support down here in Houston. I'm going to bring up free speech. There's doxing going on right now. Just this morning, I had a friend of mine. She just, I mean, I'm going to keep it confidential, but just this morning, she messaged, she reached out to, to us and said that, hey, she got fired for pe- speaking up about Palestine. Can you just give your like two cents on that? It's unacceptable. We live in a society where people can't speak freely about things we're seeing to be true. We're watching on our phones that children are dying. But speaking up against it causes you to get fired from your job. Yeah. It's unacceptable. And see, the problem right now, I'm not sure if you followed, but Bill Ackman and a bunch of Harvard alumni got the president of Harvard. Uh, yeah, did you follow that fiasco? Right? They got, they got the president yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, outed. Involved, yeah. right? And quite frankly, as an alumni from one of the schools in Boston that they're targeting now at MIT, I think we have to stand firm. If we back down right, against these kinds of tribulations, they'll always win. I mean, they, I mean, opponents of free speech, uh, and especially people uh, who are against the liberation of the Palestinian people, people who are against uh, objective human rights, uh, people who are uh, against uh, kind of speaking the truth, right? Our job is to fight. Our job mm-hmm. is to speak the truth. It's our responsibility. It's okay that these things happen, mm-hmm. right? Uh, hardships happen, getting fired, uh, losing your job. I ask people to stand you know, firm. I ask people to stand firm. 
uh, you know, my campaign, our staff, we put everything on the line for the last year. You know, we hold some opinions that have rubbed a lot of people the wrong way when it comes to foreign policy, Kashmir, Syria, Yemen. We want to cut the defense budget, yeah. right? We want to sanction the Netanyahu government. We want to place economic sanctions on the Modi regime. These things need to happen. And because of those issues, we're getting a lot of pushback, right? A lot of us may never get jobs in certain industries again, but that's okay because change will only happen if we keep pushing. We do not back down. So for people who are in this situation, hope is like a drop in a pond. Right? Courage is like a drop in a pond. You displayed courage. Enough drops fall in a pond. You can form a wave. And that wave can tackle even the tallest wall of oppression. And it takes mm -hmm. all of us. So uh, you're displaying courage by doing this. You know, our campaign staff, yeah. uh, people out there by voting, uh, these people who are, who are getting let go for speaking up, they're courageous. And I ask them to keep displaying courage. You don't mind at all that, you know, you get labeled as a pro-Palestinian um, candidate running out of, for Congress. I don't mind any label they throw at me. If you Google, they'll throw a lot of labels at me. Okay. Uh, labels, it's not about it. It's about our voters. It's about our people in Houston. They understand what we stand for. You know, we stand for truth. We stand for justice. Uh, we stand for huck, yeah. right? Uh, we stand for uh, values that I'm proud of on this campaign. We stand for compassion. Uh, we stand for a government for the people by the people, not for billionaires by billionaires. We yeah. stand uh, for ending the wars. We stand for universal health care. They can label me whatever they want. Me, my yeah. family, my staff, we know what we're fighting for. Yeah, and you proudly have a Palestinian flag in the background, so um, that's really cool to well, see. Well, it's a symbol for me. It's a symbol of um, freedom from tyranny. Mm -hmm. I have a Malcolm X flag behind you. Yeah. Uh, these are symbols for me that remind me why I'm doing this. I don't do this for myself. You know, there's not much to gain for someone like me. Mm. I do this because I really want others in the community to do it as well and realize that we're in this together. We can keep fighting. But more than anything, Akib, we have to show strength. We have to show resilience. Mm. And no one is showing more resilience in the world right now than the people of Gaza. They give yeah. me strength even through this hardship. So I keep these flags up as a reminder that no matter how hard it gets, there are people out there who are stronger and fighting. And it's my duty to fight as well. Let's talk about a little about the polling numbers. I saw recently, I think your team had shared um, a recent poll where you're ahead, you're, I think 49% to 46%. When was that poll taken? Um, <coughs> is there some bias maybe that might be involved? Can you talk about that poll? Our opponent ran a poll that showed her ahead because yeah. she pulled a small demographic of voters. We ran a field poll of all of our uh, field uh, uh, kind of uh, canvases that shows us ahead. Right, okay. all polls are inherently flawed. Uh, I do think we're gonna win this race. Why? We have the demographics, we have the better message. I'm grateful to God that we have the opportunity to mobilize the community. Uh, but really, it's gonna be razor thin. Nothing's guaranteed, right? She can run a poll that shows she's ahead because she, she targets and polls a certain demographic. We, we, we poll the entire district yeah. uh, that we've, uh, of voters that we've knocked on their doors, right? Um, there's some secret sauce behind why we think we're gonna win. Uh, but what I would say to you is every vote is really crucial. If you live Sugarland, Richmond, Mission Bend, Fort Bend County, A Leaf, Sharpstown, Gulfton, Montrose, the Heights, we need your vote, right? You can't sit at home. The stakes are too high. Not voting is a vote for Fletcher. And Fletcher is proudly backed by the APAC lobby, who is destroying democracy and, and, and funding what I think is the killing of innocent people uh, around the world. We, we can't let that happen anymore. So please don't sit at home. Okay. And how, are you, how would you say you're doing with the Muslim Americans, Arab American votes. Grateful to God. Um, what, I, what I would say is most of our support is coming from non out of non-Muslim communities. Yes, I'm a Muslim American running for Congress, but I'm a progressive Democrat who represents everybody who happens to be a Muslim, right? We have to, we have to show that we don't represent just a small stratified group, but we, we, we're here for everybody. I want mm -hmm. people to see our people in government, Muslim Americans, that, that, that we're not just looking out for one small nook or issue, but we're mm -hmm. really here for, you know, this, this area we're in has one of the highest uh, poverty rates in the city. 40% of families with children live in poverty in this area. Uh, almost 50% of people in, in the neighboring two zip codes don't have health insurance, mm -hmm. right? Most of them are Latino and African American. Uh, it's my job as a young American to go fight for them. And I think, quite frankly, right now, I'm really grateful for all the support. I couldn't do it without you. I couldn't do it without the people on the line. Uh, my message again, please don't sit at home. The real elections are the primaries. The generals right now don't matter because they're gerrymandered. This is the real election. And if we want to take seats in the U.S. Congress, we got to come out and vote in primaries. Yeah, and although, you know, we're a news organization, and you can be Democrat, you can be Republican, um, but at the same time, when it comes to, like, the Palestinian cause, the Palestinian issue, I don't think, you know, there is a, a, you know, a bipartisan thing or there's Democrat or Republican. It's a humanitarian issue. 100%. This is a very hot topic. This has been viral, um, especially since October 7th. There's the abandoned Biden campaign. You know, people say they, they're not going to vote for uh, Genocide Joe, right? That's the, his, his, the term now. It's been over four months. What's going on? We've seen in Gaza. Um, who would you recommend Muslim Americans, Arab Americans to vote for? 
Um, are you telling them to vote for a certain candidate? Because more than likely, not to sugarcoat things, we we may we might we might see Trump, you know, running as a Republican. We might, and we're most likely gonna we're probably gonna see Biden running, you know, from the Democratic side. Um, so, what is your advice to Muslim Americans? Should Muslims be voting for Biden? Well, we're kind of stuck. Most Americans are stuck. The Republicans, they stab us in the front, but the Democrats have lately been stabbing us in the back, right? The problem right now is you have two people who are almost 80 years old running for president. It's the same thing again four years later, Trump versus Biden. Mm -hmm. When is it going to end? We need term limits. We need age limits, right? Yeah. And then also, quite frankly, we need more young people running. I, I think the key problem is, look at Trump. Look at the things he said. Uh, you know, whether or not you agree with me on the line, that man does not represent us. Even as Americans, young Americans, he says some very lewd things. Now you have Biden on the other side. Oh my God, he, he literally refuses to acknowledge the genocide. The man is barely able to put a few sentences together. I'm running in the Democratic primary because this district is Democrat, but I'm proud to stand before you today saying I do not support Joe Biden. We need more people to primary the president. We, this country will not progress if we let the same people in office stay in office. So my, my ask of everybody here is whether or not you're happy or unhappy, doesn't matter. Not voting is a vote for the other side. So you gotta come out and vote. I personally uh, recently just heard from Dr. Cornell West. I really like him. Uh, you know, even though I'm running as a Democrat and I would wanna stand behind United on the Democratic Party in November, the Democratic Party needs to learn a hard lesson. And it's, if it wants to be the party in power in the future, you gotta start listening to the people. 80% of Democrats want an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. 80% want universal health care. 80% of Democrats want paid family leave. None of these three things are happening. 80, almost 70% of Democrats want to get money out of politics. Mm -hmm. We live in a one-party system. That one party is lobbyist money. The same money from the same billionaires and corporations is funding both parties. Really, it doesn't matter anymore, red or blue. Even though I'm running as a Democrat, we got to get in and start shifting this thing left. Mm -hmm. And a great quote that I heard, and hopefully I don't butcher this quote, but I heard, you know, Muslims survived four years of Trump. Um, but on the other hand, 30,000 Palestinians <coughs> did not survive the four years of Biden. And, you know, and there's still a whole year left of Biden. So um, that's just a quote that has resonated with me. And I totally understand the, the, uh, the abandoned Biden campaign. They don't respect our voting bloc. They, 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 we don't vote in large numbers. That's also another yeah. fact. But I think when I say they, I mean the establishment. I mean yeah. Republicans and Democrats both. They don't take us seriously. Yeah. I think it's time we start showing our power. We have to start voting in primaries. Let's take seats like this local one. Let's, mm -hmm. let's make ourselves known on the national scale. If we don't vote, we will never win. If we don't vote, we don't have any political power. Let's flex our political muscles.